so uh, we welcome you on this snowy January afternoon. Uh, many of us on the board were taking wagers this morning. Would there be 10? Would there be 20? Would there be 100 who would surprise us? Uh, this is a wonderful crowd. We're almost to 40, 50. I think it's because the, the big guy over here, Mr. Yepsen, has brought all of you here. So we're very appreciative of that. We're also very happy to have Mayor Vic Ritter with us, if he would stand up just for a minute. Mayor Ritter. We're also very happy to have Bill Harmon with us, who uh, was a long-time professor at SIU, and I'm sure Mr. Yepsen is the reason for that. And there are probably others of you here who have some academia con connection to our speaker today. Um, I'm going to ask Doris Grant Fry, who is a wonderful member of the Historical Society, who has the next program for us on February 7th, uh, which we're going from politics to really a very charming program because it's February, it's Valentine's uh, time. So Doris, do you want to just step up for a minute? Yeah. You know, February, what happens in February is Valentine's Day, right? So we're having our program on the 7th, and it's going to be called Handcraft of the Heart. And this is kind of a takeoff. We had an awesome quilt program last year, and this year for Valentine's Day, we're going to have smaller items, not quilts, but anything that you have that is handcrafted and was given to you, or that you maybe made yourself. You know, um, we think about crochet, knit, tatting, embroidery, cut work, all of those things that our four ancestor mothers did. Nowadays, we're into scrapbooking and paper art and all kinds of new stuff. For the guys, it might be something that is tooled leather or hand carved or whatever. So we don't want it to be a just a girls kind of thing. So bring bring your items and come on February the seventh, and we'll have I'm sure as good a time as we did at the quilt show. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, just briefly, if you're a board member here this afternoon, what you are, and Attorney Man is going to cough, so we don't want him to have an, we don't have any doctors in the house right now. So um, would you please stand, Jana Shahady, uh, Vicky, uh, no, where are Don Brandon, Marilyn Dedemese, Carlin Cookie Goodwin, uh, Bert Gordon, and Gail Reed has just come in. So let's get them. They keep it going. And I have to do it separately. Our illustrious president, Phil Stucker, who came back to us from Texas. Phil Stucker. And Gordon. All right, I will turn it over to Gordon Pruitt, who will introduce our uh, program today. Gordon Pruitt. I'd also like to recognize, uh, as a first time visitor, I think, Dr. Lanzini, who's back in the corner, and I'm glad that he had a chance to join us today. David Yepsen is an Iowa native and a 1972 graduate of the University of Iowa. In 1989, he was a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. In 2008, he served as a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard, leading the study group on the processes of the selection of the nation's president. In his book about the 1988 presidential race, the late Paul Simon praised David's objectivity. Every four years, the chief political reporter for the Des Moines Register becomes the most important reporter in the nation, Simon said. It is a position that could cause vanity and abuse. To his credit, David Yepsen handled this position with sensitivity and balance. For 34 years, David was, as the Washington Post once called him, the king of the Iowa caucuses. As a political reporter, editor, and columnist for the Des Moines Register, David covered every presidential campaign from 76 to 2008. David became renowned to the point that one candidate hand-delivered press releases to him. So it was quite the coup in, in 2009 when SIU hired him, and people all over Washington, D.C. were talking about it. So just after being hired by SIU, David goes off to dinner with Simon Institute Chair Martin Simon and then Chancellor Sam Goldman. David's phone rings. He's sitting with his new bosses. He quickly looks at the phone, it reads number unavailable, and David lets it go to voicemail. It seemed like a wise move at the time. Later that night, he listens to his voicemail to pick up the message, and that's when he learns he missed a congratulatory message from the Vice President of the United States, <laughs> Joe Biden. That's the circle of people who know and respect today's guest. Ladies and gentlemen, David Yepsen. <laughs> Well, 
Well, thank you, Gordon. That's, <laughs> I forgot about that story. I got some Joe Biden stories from, from Iowa. Well, thank you all for uh, inviting me here um, to speak today. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I've got some comments about this long list of things that I'm supposed to talk about and then throw it open to your, your questions or comments. I, uh, I earned a living as a reporter sitting in the back of rooms talking about things people in the front of rooms uh, didn't care about. And so I don't want to make that mistake and we'll have time for your questions and, and your comments as well. And I want to congratulate you on what you do to preserve history. Um, I'm a history buff. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the uh, historical association of my own town of Jefferson, Iowa, a town of 5,000 people, rural county seat town. My 89-year-old father, before she passed away, my mother, were very active in the, in the, in the historical society there. So uh, I commend you for, uh, for what you do, and I feel uh, right at home. Um, Gordon. Uh, said he wanted me to talk about politics, politicians, pensions, <laughs> peculiarities, and problems. And that reminded me of the line somebody was criticizing Iowa's economic development program as being pigs, prisons, and <laughs> poker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take a quick run through about that. Th let me tell you my Joe Biden story while I'm thinking about it since you brought him up. We were in a little town of Carroll, Iowa, which is about this size. And um, campaigning with then Senator Biden, and this would have been the 87 88 campaign. And um, we got in there about midnight, of course, there's nothing open. We're checking at the hotel, and the clerk says, um, You know, we asked him, Is there anything open? And he said, No, everything's closed, but the Godfather's Pizza is still open. And we were just famished. And so, well, at the, so we were, there was an aide, two aides, the senator, and me. Uh, and uh, cab, get a cab, you know, you can forget that. Uh, so the clerk said, well, here, just, you know, take my car. And this is about 11 o'clock, and he said, but I get off at midnight and I got a date. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> Joe Biden gets in this guy's car, which is kind of this jacked up thing with the dice and the little white balls around it. And off we go, tearing through the deserted streets of Carroll, Iowa. Got there, had our pizza, and the I gotta tell you, Joe Biden was, you know, he was watching, you know, he was watching, he's going, we gotta eat, we gotta get back on time. So he bought the kid a pizza and uh, uh, came driving back and took it and gave it to him and thanked him. And uh, uh, I asked the guy later, I said, uh, how'd the date go? And he said, well, uh, I, I married her. <laughs> so uh, that story had a, uh, a nice happy ending. But that was one of the fun things about covering presidential politics. I was born and raised in Iowa um, and uh, had always just aspired to be a political reporter in that state for the, the largest newspaper in the state. And this little thing called the presidential caucuses came rolling into, the, uh, into creation. And um, all of a sudden, a year and a half out of every four years, uh, I spent it covering presidential politics. <coughs> And it was exciting, and it was fun, um, and it was great. I just had great seats for, uh, for an incredible ball game. You, you can argue whether uh, there's a lot wrong with the way we nominate presidential candidates, um, but the fact is the state is first. Wherever you start picking an American president it is going to be a big news story, uh, and I was excited to be part of it and in the middle of it. And uh, as you mentioned, that's where I met uh, Paul and Gene Simon and uh, really came to like and respect them. Paul was a reporter, so he understood um, uh, journalism and deadlines, and he had a respect for reporters. And I remember one time we were asking him some, some questions and really peppering him, and he said that deep voice of his, he says, when I was a young man, the greatest occupational hazard of a reporter was whiskey. <laughs> With you fellas, it's cynicism. <laughs> Paul, one time we had to go, uh, I interviewed him on a public television program, and he had a, a meeting at the UAW Regional Conference downtown and uh, that he had to get to. And I said, well, we're walking on. I said, Senator, I've got a few more questions. Um, I'll just catch up with you down there. And he said, well, you're going down there? Well, why don't I just ride with you? I said, well, you are you got a staff and all these people. I said, kind of a small car. He said, no, that's okay. They can stay here. You can drive and ask me questions. and." And it'll just be efficient. And I, I turned to him and I said, 
Senator, you're going to a UAW regional conference. I'm driving a Volkswagen Rabbit on Michelin tires. <laughs> and he said, oh, <laughs> I'll see you down there. <laughs> but thank you, Dave. <laughs> so it kept me from getting in too much trouble with the, the UAW. Well, was, uh, politics. Um, talking about 2016 for, for openers. 2016 will be a definitional time for both parties. Um, it looks like Hillary Clinton uh, is the front runner for the Democratic nomination. Um, but even inside the Democratic Party, there are people who don't think she's liberal enough. Uh, and you hear some Martin O'Malley and you hear uh, noises being made about other potential candidates. Um, officially, she says she doesn't know if she's going to run. Uh, but, uh, but I think once you're bit by the presidential bug, uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, to get rid of. So I would expect uh, she's got to be the presumptive favorite for the for the Democratic nomination. The Republican uh, nomination is going to be more problem problematic. The Republican Party is really going through a period of um, you know, intense introspection about what it is and what it stands for. That's gone on inside the Republican Party since Taft-Roosevelt in 1912. It's just this line between the establishment Republicans and, uh, and I call it conservative Republicans and even more conservative Republicans. And now we're starting to see it flare up with the, the arrival and the activism of the Tea Party, uh, which is bothering a lot of establishment Republicans. Uh, the Tea Party uh, candidates have not fared too well in the last couple elections. Uh, they nominate uh, candidates who are staunch conservatives and who wind up offending uh, large segments uh, of the electorate. In Missouri and in Indiana, for example, you had Senate candidates who popped off about rape and abortion, and they say insensitive things, and not things that uh, a candidate would say. It's fine to say those things if you're trying to capture a Republican nomination, which is dominated by very conservative people, but not too smart if you're trying to win a general election. And so uh, that's the schism that's going on in the Republican Party now. It flares up all the time, and the establishment Republicans are trying to reassert themselves, uh, the business community, business Republicans, uh, but still, a bedrock of the, of, the, of the GOP are strong Second Amendment conservatives, Tea Party conservatives, social conservatives. So the Republicans are going to have a real balancing act. Uh, and one of the things I'll miss in covering um, the, the, the presidential caucuses will be how Iowa Republican activists, who are just like folks in Aaron, uh, are going to try to sort this out. They're going to want to win the White House. They're very mad that uh, they haven't been able to beat weren't able to beat Obama, and so they really want to win the White House. But they're also very conservative, and they have their principles. And, and you know, they don't want us to be seen as compromising their principles. But frankly, some of them, um, really, they're, they're Republicans in name only. They're more activists with, uh, with social issues and causes. That makes it difficult when a party uh, has got people who, who may not think that the party is as important as their issue or their cause. The Democrats went through the same thing. Uh, you'll recall, in, uh, in 1972 with George McGovern and the anti-Vietnam War activists. They took over the Democratic Party, they drove out the party regulars, and what happened? They lost elections. And, um, you know, so that's, this is history sort of repeats itself. I mean, if, if we continue that, that theme, though, it's important to remember that uh, in 1976 the Democrats did recapture the White House. But they did so running a, a centrist Georgia peanut farmer named Jimmy Carter. All right, so that's the, the lesson for Republicans is, as they look at this field of candidates, none of them stand out right now, uh, but they will after they start winning elections. Uh, one of them could conceivably go the distance. The difficulty I think Republicans have in winning the White House um, is the Electoral College. Uh, there are the growth of the Latino population. Um, in key in states like Colorado, and Nevada, uh, are taking states that were normally uh, safe Republican ones and making them competitive or putting them in the Democratic column. I've even seen some demographic projections that show that Texas uh, could even become a more dem a Democratic state or certainly a more purple state um, if that the Latino population continues to grow at the rate that it has. This is a tough one for Republicans. Uh, it's fine to be against illegal immigration, but it's how you talk about it and the words that you use 
that has effectively offended um, a lot of Latinos. And um, they come off, come, and frankly, it's come off as racist to, to Latinos. Uh, even people, Latinos who've been here for generations and, and have, who might agree with Republicans on everything else uh, get offended by that. And Republicans, I think, are making, have made a big mistake, and I'm not sure how they can recover from that. The country needs to resolve, have an immigration bill. We need to have that issue resolved. Um, and it, it's not happening because you have a lot of staunch conservative Republicans who are saying no to it. And they oftentimes do it in words that, uh, that are hostile, that alienate people, and are not very... They're not a big tent. Candidates like Ronald Reagan was a good, for example, he was a good conservative, but he had a reach to people. There were Reagan Democrats. There were, it was a big tent kind of thing. The Republican Party has to get back to that kind of candidate and that kind of message and that kind of style if it hopes to win. Uh, because, like I say, if you look at the Electoral College and how it has changed, uh, the population trends are in the country, and uh, it's, it's going to be tough for, uh, tougher for Republicans to get to 270 than it is for Democrats. But so far off, no predictions. Who can tell? I mean, you have situations that pop up, like what happened to Chris Christie, who has some AIDS that shut down some traffic lanes. How dumb can you get? Um, maybe he wasn't involved, but it reflects poorly on him. He was the boss. The buck stopped with him. Uh, so that hurts. I think that hurts his presidential candidacy. I know it hurts it with uh, people in Iowa, activist Republicans in Iowa, who take a look at somebody from New Jersey, New Jersey, and I have concerns about them anyway. And, uh, and then to do something just as thuggish as closing traffic lanes to punish a political enemy, just that's not going to that's not going to sell. So a lot of water to go over the dam uh, between now and uh, uh, and the time we start the, the caucus campaigns. Let's we're talking a little bit closer. We've got uh, a pretty good race for governor here in this state uh, in 2014, and, and that. March 18th primary is coming up. Um, four candidates uh, running on the Republican side. I tend to think that Bruce Rauner uh, has an obvious advantage in the amount of money he has, personally wealthy. Um, that's going to enable him to buy a lot of television commercials and to hire campaign workers. And he's not going to hurt for money for anything internet, radio, advertising. Um, but he has to be careful that that doesn't become an issue itself. Uh, then this, and it, you know, it's sort of you sort of saw a little taste of this in the last couple of weeks. Where uh, first there was a story about how his different positions on the minimum wage. Uh, first he's uh, he's against raising the minimum wage, and then he's for it, and then he takes in the, you know, he's taken several positions on that. Um, what's happened is, you know, you can go off into go out to some uh, small town. To a group of ten Republicans and say what you want to about it. But when you get to be when you when you get to be close to becoming governor, then you have people like reporters showing up and their little cameras that run like that, and uh, somebody catches that, and sure enough, somebody did. I mean, well, you said this there and and that over here, and so he's a, he's a, he had to back and fill, and that caused him some trouble. And I think that's evidence of the fact he's not run for office. I mean, those of you who run for office. Know have you know have have been through a crucible that most people don't have, and and it it's running for local office for the legislature for Congress governor that's good training grounds. <clears throat> American history Americans like to see people run for president who've offered some public service and maybe <coughs> run before. We've seen candidates run for president before <coughs> who ha have not run for anything else before and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and it always troubled me to, to, to see that candidates writing, I'm an outsider, I'm not part of Washington. You know, and I wouldn't go to a, a dentist who said, I don't like teeth. <laughs> I've never been there. I have no expertise on that. Well, politics is, is a game of building consensus and, and working with people and bringing diverse interests together. And it's almost the opposite of what makes you a successful, wealthy business person, where you're hard charging, where you're, you've got a vision, you know, type A, you know, kicking fannies and taking names, that doesn't necessarily work in a political context where you've got to bring people together. And so you get successful business people um, who just don't, Ross Perot, uh, Maury Taylor, uh, the guy from Chicago ran the Fruit of the Loom Company uh, who, you know, ran for president. And uh, you can see they think they can fix it. 
uh, but they can't because they don't have the skill set. So this is the kind of position that I think Bruce Rauner is in in this race. Should be in good shape, He's got, but, his, but his money and some gaffes are causing problems. And sure enough, here this story pops up that he you know, paid a quarter of a million dollars to um, help his daughter get into um, a private school. Well, what's, what's the big deal about that? I mean, a lot of people who send their kids to private school make contributions to that school above and beyond the tuitions that they pay. Uh, but it underscored to people that he was wealthy. So I think he's got uh, an image problem there uh, that Republicans are going to have to sort out um, and, and say, is this, you know, he's successful, he's articulate, um, good looking, um, we kind of need that kind of experience, in, uh, business ex business like experience in Springfield. You know, can he, um, uh, can he handle the, the job? And he's certainly got three very credible challengers who are saying th that he can't. Uh, Bill Brady. Senator Brady captured a Republican nomination in 2010, uh, so he's run uh, statewide twice, a primary and a general election. Uh, Treasurer Rutherford uh, has holds a statewide office uh, and has, has reached out and has some appeal to more centrist voters. Of course, that means some of the more conservative elements in the party don't think he's conservative uh, enough. Uh, and Kirk Dillard, who came with a handful of votes of winning the Republican nomination, uh, is in there again. So those are four very good, credible, plausible candidates that Republicans in Illinois have to choose from. And what's important to watch, and as an observer of politics, how do they conduct this primary? Do they conduct this primary that it produces an electable winner? If they get all hung up talking about social issues, talking, you know, trashing uh, the front runner, talking about his wealth, uh, then they're going to cripple um, the Republican nominee. Uh, but if they can focus on the issues on the fact that 80% of the people in Illinois think the state is headed in the wrong direction. There's more people in Illinois think the state's headed in the wrong direction than think the country's headed in the wrong direction. I mean, that's just a number that doesn't repeat itself in very many places. If they can keep the focus on the issues, on jobs in the economy, restoring fiscal health, uh, and nominate a candidate who doesn't alienate people in the center, they can win. Uh, you know, there's all kinds, there's, there's you know, reasons for Republicans to be optimistic. Uh, Democrats hold the White House, you know that off-year elections tend to favor the party out of power. Uh, they, the, the, the Illinois electorate will have fewer minority groups showing up and fewer young people showing up. Two groups that overwhelmingly voted for Democrats and for Barack Obama. Or I should say they voted for Barack Obama and then they also voted for a lot of Democrats. <coughs> Enormous help to uh, Bill Andrew in winning his congressional seat two years ago. Um, well, those people just won't show up. At the, at the polls. They, they're presidential election voters, if they're voters at all. And so what that's going to do is effectively leave uh, the Illinois electorate with a little more Republican flavor to it. And if, the key will be to, to running this kind of healthy primary um, that enables them to, to get an elected candidate. And a good example, an electable candidate, a good example of what I'm talking about was in 2010. Bill Brady wins. There's a lot of talk about his position on social issues. Uh, abortion, gay marriage, um, and some of his controversial bills um, uh, in, the, in the legislature. And he narrowly wins the primary. And sure enough, those became the issue in the fall campaign. So the same electorate that goes into the polls and votes for Republican moderate Mark Kirk, then enough of them switch to vote for Democrat Pat Quinn to enable uh, Quinn to win. Why did Bill Brady not get the same voters uh, that Mark Kirk had? And the answer is moderate women in the collar counties. Brady, you know, talking about uh, when male candidates start talking about abortion, uh, they start alienating women, particularly single women. When they start talking about social issues, they start they, they become irrelevant to the, a lot of voters who said, what are you doing about jobs? What are you going to do to fix the state? Republicans have to avoid that mistake this time. And I have to tell you, so far, uh, they have. They're, they're focusing on Rauner. They could dig him up pretty good. Um, but maybe they can get a nominee who is uh, unscathed enough to, to rage uh, a credible uh, attack against Pat Quinn. Governor Quinn has awful job approval ratings. I think his job approval ratings are among the worst of any governor in the country. People are very unhappy. Um, now, he, you don't vote against 
for somebody based on job approval. The election isn't Pat Quinn versus his job approval rating. The election is Pat Quinn versus a specific individual. And so while the labor movement is very angry with Pat Quinn, um, closing prisons, for example, uh, they're, gonna, they, they're starting to endorse him. And why? They are scared to death of the things that Rauner is saying uh, and some of these Republicans are saying, talking about labor bosses. Uh, and this is becoming an issue in the primary. You know, they, that just last night, Dillard and, and Rutherford are saying, you, know, you can't go around talking about the labor movement in a state like Illinois in, you know, without alienating uh, uh, voters. I mean, Jim Thompson was here giving a lecture at the Institute talking about how he used to go drink beer in Peoria uh, with the UAW workers at Caterpillar at, at, at 8 o'clock in the morning after they got off the shift. And they, those guys thought that was neat. You've got to be able to reach out to those Reagan-type Democrats. And, and Republicans, uh, you know, they've, got, they've got to be careful how they, how they conduct this primary because while there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who are unhappy with Pat Quinn, it reminds me of something Franklin Roosevelt said in 1937. And he was getting some trouble from a Georgia uh, Democratic senator. And some of his staff really wanted Roosevelt to take after this guy, and Roosevelt wouldn't do it. And he said, keep in mind this is a Democratic U.S. Senator in Georgia. Roosevelt said to the aide, he may be an SOB, but he's out SOB. <laughs> that's exactly where I think a lot of people in the Democratic Party are today, particularly the labor movement. Pat Quinn may be, you know, not good for us, but He's, he is one of us, and he's sure better than uh, what some of those Republicans are talking about. So you kind of got to watch how that dynamic uh, unfolds. Um, well, we, we, let's talk about the pension issue for a little bit. I don't want to. I want to save plenty of time for questions. That's the third P in the list. You <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're covering the peculiarities, so maybe we want to. Yeah. Um, this pension legislation, um, you know, any of you can pick up the Constitution and read what it says. And it says the, the legislature, uh, they, we can't, the state can't do things to uh, impair or diminish a, a, a pension. And uh, so you tell me, Counselor, how does this work that you pass a bill that reduces pension benefits but is still constitutional? So, I, don't, I mean, maybe I'm new, I've never been here five years, I'd like to know how the Illinois Supreme Court is going to uh, artfully get around that. Uh, frankly, I don't think they can. Uh, and I think the courts will ultimately strike this down. And so we're going to be right back where we were in this state of the debate before, and that is how does the state come up with the revenue to cover some of these pension benefits? Um, I don't like this pension debate in this state um, for another reason. And that is, there's a lot of bashing of workers going on. And what business do you know where the, the, the executives, the, the officers of the company, go around trashing the employees like that? As a shareholder, I want uh, leaders who will motivate workers. You know, we have dedicated public servants. They've worked hard. They've earned a pension benefit. And then we, we start referring to them bad rhetoric making people feel like we don't value their public service. <clears throat> One of the things we try to do at the Institute is encourage people to get into public service. And so I kind of don't like the pension debate when it steers into bashing uh, government workers and people who've devoted their lives to public service. I don't think it's healthy for all the rest of us. You know, we should want good people working for government <clears throat> who work overtime, who give it their best, you know, who are out there freezing, plowing the roads for us when it's stormy weather, we should thank them and not uh, try to turn other people against them. Uh, so I don't like that debate either. And uh, I think while this is going to play out, it goes like this. we got we got an income tax in this state that's going to expire at the end of this year, the 5%. It reverts back to 3.75%. That means the state is short billions of dollars. Um, Politicians are going to have to do something about this. It's going to force a tax debate in this state. Uh, there's no way around it. Uh, we're going to have to discuss things like uh, keeping the tax at 
I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how many people believe that the time has passed it was really going to be temporary. I haven't heard anybody who said, my goodness, I can't believe. I thought they were going to keep let it go back down. No, I don't think. Don't insult the intelligence of the voter. Um, secondly, uh, we're going to have to talk about tax and retirement income. I can tell by this demographic that may not be particularly popular with some people. But Illinois is one of few states that doesn't um, tax pension income. And so you could create a tax system where, say, incomes above $50,000 would be subject to the state income tax. Retirement income above 50000 Below it wouldn't be. The average um, teacher pension in this state is about $39,000. So you're not going to get uh, lower income workers or retirees, but you would get a whole lot of retirees in downtown Chicago who, uh, unlike <clears throat> their same people in other states, you know, they're, they've got a pretty light tax burden. So that's going to have to be on the table. Um, we're going to have to look at the sales tax. Um, this is sales tax in this state. It's focused more on manufacturing and not on services. Um, you don't pay the sales tax and get a haircut here. Every place else you do. So we have a very narrow sales tax base. And what Illinois could do is tax more things, broaden that sales tax. Some people would tax lawyers' fees. Other people, would, some people would tax, doc, tax doctors' bills. Uh, most states don't do that. But you tax services. Uh, and you have a broader tax, and you can lower the tax rate. Uh, and this is a real issue in Chicago, <clears throat> where you're looking at a 10% sales tax. There's all kinds of ways people uh, have of getting around paying the sales tax in the city of Chicago. You want to have a, a sales tax that's low and broad, is paid in pennies, and is not very onerous for people. Uh, the other thing that's going to, we're going to have a discussion about is expanded gambling. State needs the revenue. Um, that's, that's an emotional debate. It's a regressive tax if you look at who gambles, but nobody forces people to gamble, so maybe that's a way to capture uh, more revenue. Uh, so those are the kinds of issues that we're going to have to discuss in this state uh, in order to pay, uh, cover the costs uh, of, this, of this income tax going down. Some people want to go to a graduated income tax rather than a flat rate income tax. Uh, like we have in most states. Um, so that'll be on the table, too. You'd have to change the Constitution to get that, so it, it might take some time. But here's an example. Everybody talks about Indiana and how, how well they're doing uh, compared to, to Illinois. They've done some studies. If you took the Indiana tax code and put it on top of the Illinois economy, you'd raise $5 billion a year more. So it isn't that they're taxing more. It's just it's spread out. And if you have a, a, a tax system that's more balanced, you can do some, some things to, to help cities lower property tax rates, um, to lower really all rates, but to try to make government uh, a little easier for people to uh, pay for. Well, now that debate's, I think, going to have to occur just if the, um, if the, tax, the income tax is allowed to expire. And I can see where we have that debate probably in the lame duck session in November of this year. They won't do anything about it, certainly prior to the March primary. But then they'll go through all summer long. Nobody wants to do anything before the campaign of the voters. And then we come back in the lame duck session and boom. I mean, that's how the tax was raised. And one thing I've noticed is how fast the legislature can move in those lame duck sessions. Okay? So that's one scenario. But then add this to it. The Supreme Court says, your pension bill is unconstitutional. The Constitution says you can't diminish these pension benefits. All of a sudden, boom, you've got to come up with a way to pay for that. And so that is going to force, really force, the debate over coming up uh, with some more revenues. And I think what that, what that court ruling will do is enable a whole bunch of legislators to stand and say, you know, I didn't want to do this, but it's so Mean justices on the Supreme Court who forcing us to do this. We passed the law. They said it was unconstitutional. We've got to raise your taxes. You'll hear. I think you'll hear that kind of. You'll hear that kind of rhetoric within the next. Uh, within the next year. I didn't. Don't. Don't. I didn't want to do it. But there it is. I. I really. I really think politicians who do that don't treat people like adults. I used to enjoy covering Paul Songus because I believe I like kind of Churchillian politicians. Will stand up and tell us things that we don't want to hear. Um, 
that we've got to have to have higher taxes. Jim Edgar did that. Um, Paul Simon did that on a balanced budget amendment. Uh, he hurt him a lot inside the Democratic Party, but it's called courage. And this is where one of the things that troubled me about uh, Illinois is the ethical climate. It has consequences for our budget and our finances. Nobody trusts politicians here. Nobody. You ask job approval polit of, of politicians, do you respect them? Nobody in public life, everybody in public life is suffering from the actions of a few and the state's reputation for crooked politics. And it's not a laughing matter anymore. Um, you know, people, I used to, people in Illinois would tell me stories about the politics and here and they kind of laugh. Mike Royko had a great line, what's the motto of the city of Chicago? Where's mine? <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's, it, it's funny, but you know, frankly it isn't. Because what it's done is, you have state fiscal problems. It discourages us uh, from having economic development in this state. Uh, I uh, ran into the guy that started the Monocles Pizza Chain. And I made the point that unethical government is uneconomical government. It hurts because business doesn't want to locate in the state uh, where they don't know what the taxes are going to be and they don't want to pay to play. If I'm a business, some of you people have been in business, and you want to locate and expand in Illinois or you want to go to Indiana or Iowa or Missouri. Well, you can say, gee, how are they going to pay those debts? I don't know whose taxes are going to get raised. What are they going to do to them? Maybe I'll go to another state, expand my business, or open it there. And the guy from Monocle's Pizza said, you know, come to think of it, the last three pizza joints I've opened have been in Indiana. So this ethics stuff has consequences in terms of our economic growth, but it also has consequences because nobody trusts politicians enough to enable one of them to stand up and say, you know, we've got to pay more money. Trust me, I can, I'll do it right. I'll be fair about it. It's going to cost the people in Illinois uh, more money. And, ha and explain to people how this happened. That we've had public services we haven't paid for, um, and we've spent money unwisely, and there's been waste and corruption, and, and, and we're going to do everything we can to stop it, but the fact is we've got debts we have to pay. So here's my plan for paying. <clears throat> In other words, treat voters like adults. And uh, unfortunately, and there are not a lot of Jim Edgars and Paul Simons on the scene today who can say that to you with enough credibility that you're going to believe them and say, okay, let's, let's talk about doing something. Well, I've gone on. I want to save time for questions or comments here. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things, and so the... I can tell a little more stories from Iowa if you want to do that. But, uh, yeah. I think within the <clears throat> last month, uh, I like to watch the, the show on Sunday, over at SIU. Mm -hmm. And I think Jim Thompson was on one of those. Right. And uh, I have to say, as they asked him questions, he seemed like he had all the answers, or a lot of really good, viable answers. Uh, somebody should listen to his platform. <laughs> well, you know, he <coughs> was a pretty successful political figure in the but, state. But he, came, he came back with, with very good answers on just about everything. Mm -hmm. He's got some good ideas. So. And, and I agree with you, yeah. but here's the problem. Uh, could Jim Edgar get nominated? Could, could Jim Thompson get nominated by the Republican Party? No, no but, but I mean, so, someone in down the line there needs to talk yeah. with him. Yeah. What I mean. And he told people things they didn't want to hear. And he was also a skilled political figure. He, mm -hmm. you know, he worked with Democrats and their uh, Democratic legislators wooed him and cut deals and all that. That's what politics is. Politics is the art of who gets what, where, why, and how in society. But we're like in a how we allocate different resources. era right now, but he still, have he still has relevant things to say for, for today and the future. Yeah, but you could, he was talking about raising the sales tax. Nobody in the Republican Party wants to talk about that. Hmm. Other questions or comments? Cover one. Yes, sir. I'm sure you read uh, Bill McClellan, mm -hmm. uh, this morning's column. I've read this. To, to the point, um, you know, he didn't quite say so, but Hillary's time has passed. Would you agree with that? It could be. It could be. Um, 
That's a political answer. <laughs> well, the reason I, I've, I've learned I've never I've learned not to go that far in terms of predicting what's going to happen in, in 2016. Um, her age and the the ins and the tensions inside the Democratic Party. I mentioned Martin O'Malley. Uh, there's there are liberal Democrats who don't think she's liberal enough. The war in Iraq. Um, you know, there's that tension inside the Democratic Party. And I, I don't try, I'm not trying to equivocate here. Uh, I, I just think the verdict's out on whether anybody's seriously going to challenge her, whether she's just going to back away and and uh, and not do it. But if she throws her hat in the ring, uh, I don't know. I think it'd be hard to beat her in a Democratic primary. Yeah. In that case, then her time hasn't passed. Yeah. Is Benghazi going to hurt her? Um, maybe. Could. <clears throat> You're thinking about what's that, where's that issue going to be in a year? Okay, a year from now, when we're, we're in, in the early part of, of 2015, and then again in another year, in 2016, when voters actually start to vote, where's that issue going to go? Um, will it, and it, it could have played out by that. It's, it's embarrassing now. The second thing is that seems to only resonate with Fox News. It's not on the radar. Politics is always a game of what are you going to do for me, not what have you done. So Clinton haters will use that as more evidence of why they don't like Clinton. But she never had those people to begin with. Um, the question will be who is speaking to the, the electorate at, at the time and the future of the country. And there will be a lot of women who will say, it's our time. It's our turn. The boys have had their turn. That, I saw that feeling at work um, uh, in covering her campaign in, in the early stages of the Iowa caucuses. And you can ask the women in this room how that works. Um, there is a real sense of she's a trailblazer. And so I'm not sure Benghazi will be a determinative factor. Do you think it should? Well, is there something more to be said about it? What more is there to say about it? Yeah, what more is there to say about it? You don't know? I, well, I mean, they've had investigations, the, uh, all kinds of investigations about it. Is there something new we don't know? Well, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure that I know what you know about it. What you <laughs> I know what I've read, <laughs> just like you. I'm not privy to State Department cables and that sort of thing. I just don't know if there's anything more to add to the story. If that's the case, how are you going to keep it alive for two more years before people start to vote? So that's why I say I, I think it may be run out of gas by that time. Yes. David, I have a question. Yep. Well, she had her hand up over there. I was wondering if you could make a comment or what you, you think about just the corporate largesse in this country. I worked in a large hospital in Chicago for 15 years. Um, our staffing was cut to the absolute minimum to where it was dangerous. Don't go to the hospital unless you take somebody with you. But our CEO made $10 million. Right. He was the highest paid CEO of a hospital in the country. And it seems to me that that's not just in the hospital and medical field, that's in manufacturing and everything. The workers get <coughs> that, but these CEOs and the whole management style of the whole organization is built on this. Profit, profit driven, like the workers can, you know, matter for yeah. nothing. So. I mean, is that an issue in any politics? Is anybody looking at that, or is it just yes. business it's a, as usual? Uh, <laughs> it's a huge issue, and it's it's getting to be an even greater issue because the gap between the wealthy and the unwealthy is widening in this country. It's not we're losing a middle class. You're either going to be well off or mm -hmm. poor, uh, and so it has all kinds of ramifications on other issues. Um, but we're, there, there are tensions developing in society uh, over questions like who gets access to health care and who doesn't. Um, you know, there are some theory, economic theories that say that the top highest paid person in the company should not earn more than a multiple of, say, 20 times with the lowest paid worker. Well, in the U.S., it's easily more than 100 in some cases, as you mentioned. So the concentration of wealth, uh, it's always been an issue in our politics. And, uh, and it's going to be an issue in this campaign of how do we bring along people who have not shared in the bounty? How do we take care of more Americans? We've always believed in America 
in a healthy middle class. And our tax policies and, and spending priorities uh, are not working for them. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, but that's what the minimum wage debate is all about. You raise the minimum wage so that it becomes a living wage, and if you do that, is it a job killer? Does it mean fewer, there are fewer entry-level jobs for people? That debate has gone on you know, since FDR started to, uh, to try to enact a minimum wage. Um, but I can tell you it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an issue and it's a growing issue, and it's one Dem both parties have dramatically different solutions for it. Uh, Democrats are talking about the minimum wage, Republicans don't like it, so you'll hear it in the race for governor, you'll hear it in the race for president. Um, I think it's a, it's a challenge for Republicans because they have to talk about it in a way that is caring and compassionate, the way Reagan talked about it, and bringing people along, and Big Ten, uh, and, and not get into a class warfare thing, which is a tactic Democrats often try to, try to use. We've been here before in our history. I'm reading the Doris Kearns book, Goodwin book about uh, FDR and uh, I'm not I'm about Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft and the media. And the Gilded Age was another period in our history in which the wealth gap grew in America and it caused all kinds of other problems. And it gave birth to the Progressive Era, uh, which lasted for 20 or 30 years. We are going to need to, if, we're going to have to address it somehow because you're going to start creating all kinds of undesirable social problems. In this country. So, yeah, good question, good issue. I mean, I don't have nearly all the answers. I mean, my only answer to that is education. Uh, I tend to believe that the best stimulus package is education, and that means Head Start, K-12, through I mean, it's all levels, so community communities <coughs> especially. Um, but that can't be the only, the only answer. <coughs> Yes, you had a question? I did, but I may have forgotten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have some. All right, go ahead. Um, no. if I'll someone, her and then I'll get to you. If someone asks you this right now, I mean, are you optimistic about the future of the country? Is there some way we can join together and be friendly again? I mean, the opposing viewpoints to me just seem shattering when it can destroy friendships and marriages and brothers and right. sisters. What well, happened to compromise? I, yeah, I wish I could uh, be optimistic because, uh, particularly about the civility issue. Again, that was something we like to foster at that institute in terms of working with students. Um, well, unlike another other era and eras in American politics, we have things now like television, radio, the internet, uh, Twitter, the blogosphere. Um, the level of venom that is out there in American society is just huge. Uh, our media, our news organizations, um, more and more, we're going back to the future in, in journalism. We're going back to the era of yellow journalism, where uh, you don't want an objective report of what's going on. You want a report that reinforces your bias. So if you're a conservative, you're watching Fox News, and you're reading the Wall Street Journal. And if you're a liberal, Progressive, you know, you're reading the New York Times uh, and watching Rachel Maddow on MSNBC, and uh, you know Americans used to talk. We'd argue, at least we'd argue and we'd disagree, but we'd argue over the same set of facts. Now, now it's just like this: we're talking past each other because news managers, owners of news stations, they want attitude in their news coverage, uh, and and they want edginess. And so the premium that that you that uh, a politician is rewarded with media coverage and television exposure by saying outrageous things. And the centrists, the people in the middle, the calm, work hard, work with your friend, your, a Jerry Costello or a John Shimkus, you don't hear from them. It's all the bomb throwers and the hot, hot rhetoric that we hear about. So part of it is the fault of people in my business, the news business. Uh, because of the reward that, that comes out. You get covered if you do something outrageous and, and a lack of civility. Now, the Republicans learned a lesson in shutting down the government, the Tea Party did. That's why we just had a budget passed. They're going to fight about, they want, they want the fight to be about Obamacare and, and not about shutting down the government. So they, you know, they did learn that lesson. But we're such a long way from 
returning to a, 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 a civility uh, in politics. Secondly, we tend to don't glamorize the past. American politics has always been pretty rough and tumble. When you go back and look at your history, Grover Cleveland, father to child out of wedlock, and there was the great epithet, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? And, um, you know, ordinarily you would think that would be, Cleveland would be toast, but he won. And his supporters took that and came back with the saying, gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. And <laughs> the difference between then and now, you did have raucous politics. I mean, look what they called Abraham Lincoln. Um, a monkey. You know, racist uh, cartoons. So it's been there. It's always been there. It's always been bare knuckles and rough and tumble and there's been a fair amount of corruption. But the media now just pours it into our lives like never before. You know, radio, TV, the internet, the blogosphere, Twitter and your smartphone, you can't get away from it. We are awash in information. And which means a lot of people are sick of it and are willfully tuning it out. They're saying, I don't want to hear any of it. And, and that leads to an uninformed electorate, <clears throat> which going back to some of these things we've been talking about here, how do you solve the problems in this country if you have an electorate that isn't informed. The founders understood you had to have an informed citizen. Okay, that's why we created public schools. That's why the First Amendment is first. Okay, an informed citizen who requires this. And if we start losing that, then we really, then we really are in for an era of pessimism. Here's, here's my only note of optimism is, yeah, America will do the right thing, but it takes a crisis, oftentimes, to make them do the right thing. You, this is a historical society, okay? So think about your history. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, trying, knowing what he knew about having to, tr what the Germans were doing. I mean, it took the sinking of the Lusitania. It took crisis for Americans to wake up about that threat. Uh, there were people warning about what the Japanese were up to in the Pacific. Uh, and yet there were people, Americans just didn't want to uh, hear that. They didn't want to get involved in, uh, in, a, in another war. Great book out on Roosevelt and Lindbergh. And the, you know, Roosevelt's mastery of, of politics was he defeated the isolationists led by Lindbergh. Uh, but it took the bombing of Pearl Harbor to wake us up. I mean, time and again in our history we have seen, we, th we let things get to a crisis before we change our ways uh, and our attitudes. It took a Great Depression to change the country's attitudes toward uh, government intervention. Uh, now that got to get to pretty low before we people said, well, yeah, maybe we do have a need for some government intervention today. <laughs> at, at, a time, at the time, there were lots of politicians in both parties who didn't want to do anything. You know, the Hooverism kind of thing. Well, today we accept Social Security as, as a fact. We accept health care programs as a fact. So whatever problems we have, and it may be happening with, with the economy and with, with debt. Uh, I think before we convince people to do something different, to change your mind, uh, to take a problem and, and approach it differently, uh, it's going to take a crisis. Now, I hope we're not looking at more wars or depressions or that kind of thing. But what will wake up Americans? What will prompt them to reach out across the aisle, to tone it down, to work together? Americans do pretty well. Uh, under adversity. Look at 9-11. That spirit that existed right after that. I mean, how do you get back to that? Gosh, I, who wants another 9-11? But it, somehow we get back to that, where we came together, we set aside some of our, some of our rhetoric, and, and when that time comes, it'll be a time for leaders to stand up and ask people to make some sacrifices and to do things differently. You know, you may be a good conservative, but you're going to have to help pay off the national debt. Uh, you know, you may be a good liberal, but you're going to have to help by cutting government spending. Getting people to do things that they haven't been willing to do. It's a long answer, but I, 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 it's, not a, it's not an easy question. <coughs> I wish I could be more optimistic. <laughs> yes? Well, with what you're saying, what about term limits? That Because most people that are in politics are, my opinion, they do what they do to get votes. Right. But if you had term limits, they could stand up and do what's right. Um, and some states have tried that. The, the, the two problems with that, of 
the, the places where they've tried it, there's no real evidence that they are, that has any impact on the on public policy. I mean, you look at a state that has term, the states that have term limits. Are their pensions any sounder? Are their budgets more balanced? Uh, California has term limits, but they voted to weaken them, and it helped them create, keep some people around to do something. Um, I'm kind of ambivalent about it. My feeling about term limits is they wouldn't be necessary in this state if you didn't have gerrymandering of legislative districts. <coughs> that if you want to, uh, the, the single biggest political reform you can make in Illinois, and there's a laundry list of them, is go to nonpartisan redistricting. Who holds the crayons? Yes. Let's, have, let's have a citizens commission do it, let's have a nonpartisan staff. You go in there with a computer, you pay no attention to party registrations or voting behavior, you pay no attention to the residents of incumbents, and you draw the lines. And then you may have to make some adjustments to comply with the Voting Rights Act. Because you can't discriminate against minorities and you can't pack them all together either, all right? So you do have to make, make some tweaks. But this is happening in other states. It's happened in California, it's happened um, in, in Florida. Uh, they've done it that way in where I come from uh, since the 1970s. And it's led to the, one of the most competitive states in the country. There's a normal turnover of legislators. About a third of the legislature, is, at least a third of it, is different every 10 years. Uh, you don't have a concentration of, uh, of, of power. Um, you know, even... So, in Iowa, what we, do, we did it that way. There's actually staffers that go, that go do it. That might not work in a state like Illinois. You know, this is four or five times larger. But if it'll work in California, if it'll work in Florida, <coughs> Redrawing redistricting lines and by with nonpartisan citizens commissions, I think it could work in Illinois. And it isn't just the state level; it's in uh, local government, particularly in Chicago. You'll hear that complaint from a lot of people in Chicago about the machine, um, and so that that makes it difficult. Now, if you can't get that done, then you're going to have to resort to something like term limits, which is a crude tool, if you think about it. I mean, we're going to we're we're going to pass a law that tells people who they cannot elect. If I live in Marion, I might like to have John Bradley as my legislator. But somebody's going to tell me I can't vote for him. I'd rather, I'd rather have John Bradley have to worry about getting uh, running in a more competitive district. Because this is more than you want. This, one of the things that contributes to what she was talking about, the division of our society, is the gerrymandering of congressional and legislative districts. And both parties do it. You, you, pat, you have very Republican districts and you have very Democratic districts. What that means is if you want to get elected, you got to get nominated. And once you get nominated, you don't have to worry about the general election. So there's every incentive, if you're running in a Democratic district, to just to be really far on the left. You're trying to appeal the most liberal elements in our society because those are the people who are going to vote in that Democratic primary. And on the Republican side, the most right wing. And you do it with language that's not very constructive. We talked about language in Republicans in the immigration debate. That's a good example. But the same thing happens on the left. Some of the things that uh, you can hear at a labor hall about corporate executives, all right? Uh, so there's all, it, you heat up all that rhetoric on both sides. And there is no incentive to work together. In fact, you can get penalized for working together, for trying to cross party lines. Uh, by the people back home. I mean, what's, what are most U.S. Senators worry about in the Republican U.S. Senators? About being tea party in a primary. Because one, you know, once, so, so I think we go to, by going to this nonpartisan citizen commission redistricting that I described, where you let the computer do it, let the chips fall where they may, what's going to happen? You're going to create a few Republican districts, you're going to create a few Democratic districts, but you're going to create a whole lot more districts that could go either way. And then you're going to have to have independent candidates, centrist candidates, candidates who can appeal to both sides, who if, even if they're a Democrat, they, they get along with the Republicans, and there's going to be a whole lot more collegiality that happens in our politics. It is key. And uh, incidentally, if you care about this issue, there is a petition drive underway now. The, it's called the Fair Vote Amendment. Um, I think the website is independentmaps.org. They're trying to get a proposal like that on the, the ballot, and they're collecting signatures. Uh, to, to do that, you can 
go online and have them send you a petition and take it around and get people to sign it, to put that very issue on the ballot in November. It'd be hard to do. It's not sure it's constitutional. And certainly the powers that be in the political machines will be fighting it in the courts. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's an option that's out there. You know, I've been hanging around politicians so long I talk to them. Uh, <laughs> we got one last question. We're coming up at the end of our allotted time. Well, want to my, okay, go ahead. My question was, um, it wasn't about the term limit thing, but when you said what you did. But what? why does the state argue uh, with each other? You know, they joke or laugh about and say, we ought to divide Illinois into two states, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When we need to work together and why is Chicago so against us southern people where we have the property where we could put industry in? We have the room, mm -hmm. the acreage. Cairo, I mean, is mm -hmm. nothing, has gone to nothing. And it's got a railroad. It's got Ohio, the Mississippi. We have all this that could mm -hmm. help. So why do we, and that's been for probably Long 100 time. years. Um, First of all, we're not alone in that. The same kind of tension that exists in New York State, between New York City and upstate New York, that exists in California, in Northern California and Southern California. Wherever you have big cities, you're gonna have the rest of the states, in Minnesota even, you have the Twin Cities and then place else. So we're not alone. Uh, Illinois is a pretty big state, you know, as just geographically, and so it, it's very, it's very diverse, and uh, if you were drawing a state today, you probably wouldn't draw it this way. But um, so the question is, you know, you're not going to change the state lines. I mean, we're not going to divide into two states. We've settled that because of the Civil War. Um, I think the last one we created is West Virginia. So the car got on there. Um, I think one of the, I think I had. This is a huge problem, and, and it's something we've got to recognize. But there's regionalism, and people feel alienated. Um, everybody thinks somebody else is getting something or doesn't understand our problems. The best example of this is the gun issue, uh, where you clearly have rural-urban uh, divides. So how do we overcome this? I think one thing we have to do is to try to find better ways to understand each other. What does it mean to be an Illinois? People don't think of themselves as Illinoisans. They think of people, they think of them. Yes, yeah, somebody, where are you from? I'm from Southern Illinois. Where are you from? I'm Chicago. Yes, yeah, somebody who worked. Where I come from? Where you come from? I come from Ohio. A little different. Nuance. Um, where's the media? Where's the, what's the statewide media? Um, you go to Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska. You have statewide public television networks. You have statewide public radio networks. Uh, there's no media in this state that helps to tie us together. I mean, that's one of the functions of the media in a democratic society is to give people information that they need to survive. Uh, people in southern Illinois have, many people have no idea what's going on on the streets of Chicago with guns. And many people in Chicago have no idea what firearms mean in rural America. And, okay, how do we have a better understanding of that? Well, maybe if we were watching some of the same programs, or saw, read some of the same newspapers, uh, people would have a little bit of different understanding about what, what how, walking in the other guy's shoes, understanding that thoughtful people, opinion leaders in both places, so that then they could at least talk. It's in this competition, this, this division is not healthy for any of us. I mean, people in southern Illinois are very envious of, uh, are, are, you know, you hear antipathy towards Chicago. The hard reality is Chicago is the economic engine of this state. We get a lot of money out of Chicago. But the governor should go and live in Springfield. You know, there's a governor's mansion there. Part of this has started happening because the governor won't go to Springfield and live. Like the Blagojevich stayed in Chicago yeah. and Quinn stays in Chicago. And it's like if you're the governor of Illinois, you should go to the seat of the government and run the state from there. You know, people get the idea then, well, Chicago's the only thing that matters because they won't even know no. it. I wish I brought my map. We have. A, I had one of our graduate students make a map of the state of Illinois, in which, in fact, if you give me an email, I'll send it to you. Um, the state of Illinois is 
the counties are sized according to the number of votes they have. Okay, and there's a giant dot for Cook County <laughs> and about five other big one globs around it. Uh, Colorado County is a couple down here for Monroe and St. Clair. And then here's Southern Illinois, these tiny little dots. Pat Quinn and politicians live in Chicago because that's where the votes are. And uh, in fact, there's a Harvard study, going to your point, that the question was whether states with where the capital city is not the largest city have more corruption than states where the largest city is the capital city. And the, 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 the theory that they're testing is that there's less media attention paid in, in states where the capital is not in the, the largest city. And that's true. You go to Chicago, they don't pay much attention in Chicago media what goes on in Springfield. They pay more attention to what goes on in City Hall. And what that means is you have an uninformed electorate. Uh, and so a governor is going to live where the votes are. <laughs> and uh, I mean, even, you know, Jim Edgar lived in the mansion, but he spent a lot of time in Chicago. I don't, I think that's what you've described as more of a kind of a symptom rather than a, a cause of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be a good symbol for a governor to do that, mm -hmm. but the reality is that any governor of either party is going to need votes in, in Chicago or Cook County. I'll, uh, I'll give Gordon a copy of the map to bring uh, for your next meeting to, to look at, because it's telling <laughs> State politically does not look like it does geographically. Well, how can the legislature pass laws with the exception of Chicago? I don't. I have never understood that. They pass a law and good for the whole state. Except Chicago, except yep. I don't understand that. Yep. And that causes some. No, I know. I'm. I'm not going to defend it. I think it you know, causes a lot of this. This tension. Yeah. But I think we could do something with the media in the state, the public media particularly. Uh, we might be able to pull ourselves together, but. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to do because media markets are getting smaller. Chicago papers see, don't, don't make any money down here. Public radio and television you know, couldn't support that kind of infrastructure, although they do in those other states that I mentioned. And people, people like yourself who care, they, they know that they can listen to the legislature debate in Wisconsin. They wired their capital with fiber optics, and they're more informed. Uh, so. And that's something else there. We need to figure out a way to get the voters and the populace to at least watch as much or get as interested in politics as they do in the Super Bowl or something like that. That's, that's I mean, they'll raise hell about, about uh, paying taxes and then give $4,000 for a seat in the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. I tell my, my students in my journalism class that politics is the only game for adults, that it, that it doesn't matter. A ball game or entertainment, that's entertaining and, and we all enjoy it, but it doesn't have any consequences. It makes a difference who you get, who you elect president. It makes a difference who you elect as a mayor. And, and that's why politics, I call it politics the only game for adults. So. Well, I've gone way over my time. You want I just said one thing. All right. I've learned, maybe you should really never take the last question. <laughs> Probably not. No, okay. because this actually supports what you were saying about education. Why aren't they teaching civics in school? Yeah, we yeah. have civics, and they don't even yeah. teach that anymore. You go to grade schools today, they don't have a clue as to how the government works. Right. <laughs> well, we're, we're, uh, that's a good question. The answer is there's been an emphasis on math and science, uh -huh. and plus there's been schools are being starved for money, and that's going to continue, and so they're putting their, uh, their priorities there. Plus, we look at our schools as part of entertainment. You know, our public education system provides us with entertainment on Friday night. Um, so those are, you know that, you know that. Um, but one thing to think about, we're, doing, we're, we're partnering with the McCormick Foundation on a program uh, to increase civic education in schools and to help local teachers get, uh, do a better job with the city's programs that they have. And we, uh, they just put together a really nice one in Carbondale, um, and they're working on another one in Marion. And uh, over in, uh, along the river, in Shawnee, um, and those kids over there had a really great civic education program, arguing about finding ways to fix the levees. And so there are things that you can do in your local school 
with the resources that you have. But you just have to get people focused, and the school board has to have a priority, and the school principal. There are ways to uh, to do that, and if you give me your address when when we leave. I'll send you some stuff about the program we have. We have a grant. We have grants. We set aside seven thousand dollars, thousand dollar grants to give to these schools that are trying this to beef up their their local programs. And then we do a conference each year to bring local teachers together to share ideas. Because what you do in you know Heron, you can also do uh, in Marion. And, and but it's, it's, it's helping the debate team get going, studying more history, having history fairs, showing people how to vote, you know, bringing election officials in to show them what a ballot is. You can vote at 17 now in a primary in this state. It's a new law. Well, are we getting kids signed up to vote in primaries? That kind of stuff. I just, I agree with you. We try, we're trying to do, we're, at the institute, we're trying to do something about it down here in Southern well, this has been a great group. I've talked far longer than I should have. Thank, thanks for coming. Thank you. Where's the phone? Oh, back again. Yes. <laughs> back again. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I see you. We still have a lot of refreshments.